Hi everyone, uh, I'm back here at St. James School Mission on Beaver Island um, and um, we're going to jump right into week one of our course together. I apologize the video didn't get uploaded in time uh, here on Beaver Island. Uh, life moves a little bit slower and so does the internet. Um, after multiple attempts and uh, after a four hour upload process, I was able to get the first video that I, the intro to the course posted. So uh, hopefully this one will be up there today and we won't have that same problem. Um, jumping right in before we get there though, um, just want to highlight that there are some references and some tools that are um, the publisher makes available on their website to help you to go through the book, uh, some outlines, tests, and stuff there for teachers of the text, but as you are looking through it, um, Think about how you can use this information in your own in your own ministry. So some of those resources might be very helpful for you to be thinking about this material. Uh, as we start with this uh, kind of first p part of our course together, we look at how Christian um, thinking and theology has developed uh, throughout the centuries. And and the important thing is that that word development. Um, so often in our culture and today in the state of religion, we think about certainty and the importance of that this is the way things are, or this is the way things have always been. But it's not true. We see that throughout history, Christian thinking and um, theology has developed and redeveloped and, and taken on things and reinterpreted them and abandoned some ideas. And our job as uh, ministers and as theologians, as we all are theologians, is to how do we take um, take all of that, all that process, all that movement, all that, that those ideas, and create a coherent, um, a coherent witness of Christian thought, a coherent understanding of how that is a normative practice of, of how we come to know God is through this relational perhaps back and forth. And maybe we emphasize different things at different times in, in the life of the church and in the life of us as an individual. We start with the patristic period. Uh, this is the, the first kind of beginning of the church, the church fathers, um, as they were called. And uh, these, um, during this, this is the, the point in time that people always are reaching back to from here on forward. They're reaching back and they're looking for some theologian who they can say, they said this, they were a patristic uh, early church father, and so therefore this is the way that it is. But you can see that the witness of the patristic fathers, the, the first theologians, it wasn't coherent either. They were arguing and discussing and debating, and it all is leading up to this defining of what it is to be a Christian, what, it, what Christian thinking really is. You'll see that the, um, through the, the work on, and not the fighting against heresies and working towards the def definition of um, conciliar Christianity in the Nicene Creed, you see that there's this defining who is in, who is out. This is okay, this is not. Uh, one of the theologians that you um, read a little bit about was Origen. And Origen, um, he was a great mind. Uh, he wrote in, in the 200s. And um, he uh, has a definition in one of his major works on first principles, or periarchum, that uh, is very much like the Nicene Creed, um, except for one addition, and that's that um, scriptures have a secret meaning that you can, the more you read them, and if you read them in the right way, that the true meaning of scripture will be revealed to you. Um, he then went on to write all sorts of interesting things, um, but he was later condemned as a heretic. And although that he was seen as one of the most important and influential Christian thinkers for all the development of Christian thinking that happens after him. He himself was labeled a heretic, not once, but twice, um, and, uh, but has been uh, kind of reawakened and new understanding. One of the things that uh, was very uh, difficult in his understanding was he believed in what's called the apokatastasis, which is uh, basically universal salvation, not just for humanity, uh, but also for all created beings, all minds, he said, um, and that included angels and demons and humans and included the devil, um, that we would all go to back to where we began. We would return to God and that we would all be reformed in our way of thinking through biblical interpretation and reading and thinking and, and focusing our attention back on God. Um, a fascinating theologian who really pushed the bounds of what it meant to uh, 
what Christian thinking and teaching might mean, what Christ uh, meant and um, his coming meant and how we understood humanity. Um, his work would, especially this understanding that uh, in the scriptures you can find allegorical interpretations or what um, Karl Rahner, a theologian from the modern period, said, the spiritual sense of scripture, that there is this deeper meaning found within scripture. It's not just black and white, um, but there's a deeper meaning of helping us to understand more of God and more of our relationship with God. We move into the Middle Ages um, and the Renaissance period, and here we see the development of um, centers of learning that um, we had those in the Patristic period too, uh, but they become a bit more codified and, and develop, just as they did in the earlier period, their own kind of take an identity and, and kind of approach to uh, understanding Christianity. Um, so you have the cathedrals and the monasteries and the religious orders and the universities. Um, and, and this gives rise to the sense of scholasticism, this really trying to have a rational justification for what we believe, what religious belief is and how you can do it. This is not certainty though. It's a really kind of nuanced thing. So often when you read the scholastics, it's so easy to be like, oh, he, this is, he knew it all and this is the way that it was. But they're giving rational justifications for why this might be understood this way. Um, and so it's more of a kind of a, this is one way of going about it. Uh, and there would be m multiple ways of coming to understand of uh, the same, perhaps, um, religious belief, or perhaps a different understanding um, of a certain religious belief as well. Um, we see during this time um, this development of humanism, which is not what we would think of today, but rather just this reaching back to the patristic period, like we talked about. This is where we're always reaching back to, reaching back to see and try to understand the theologians that came uh, from before us and understand how they were uh, and what their teaching was and how that we can give justification for that understanding today and uh, during this time period. Um, important people during that part, um, uh, reaching back to Augustine. Augustine became huge in the life of the church and our understanding of Christianity. And um, that had big implications for us. I mean, our understandings of what it is to be human and our understandings of original sin and all of those things uh, strongly influenced by Augustine a patristic father who was really brought out and dug up and used a lot during scholasticism, uh, that period. There was an interesting development in the Byzantine theology in the East, in Eastern Orthodox theology, that theology was the mind of the saints. And so this was this idea that the saints were both current and before. So our thinking had to jive with the thinking and go with the thinking of the saints who'd come before us. And um, so it was, theology was something that happened in community. It wasn't something that one person could go and sit and think and, you know, like, okay, I'm going to tell you all the things you need to know. But it was the mind of the saints. It happened in community. Uh, a very different idea than uh, we oftentimes uh, look for. Um, Throughout this period, reason is huge. How do we kind of rationally understand things? How do we build, how do we build um, systems of understanding towards a particular thing? Not so much that this is the way that it is, but how do we come to that rational understanding of it? Uh, we see a consolidating of the patristic tradition. As I mentioned, they're reaching back and they're picking and choosing those things that fit with their kind of systems and structures that they're trying to build, um, these scholastic systems. We see that there's um, biblical criticism takes on a new role here. And, um, and But it's not necessarily the, um, this isn't the first time that that's happened. Uh, we see that even in the patristic period, we see people trying to wrestle with what, is, what does this text mean? How do we understand it? Uh, but this is the first time that we understand that the, maybe the translations that we've been working with are not really that accurate and aren't giving us the truest meaning. Again, that reaching back to try to get to the true meaning, the heart of, of things, and to, to build an understanding about it. We move into the Reformation period, and this uh, period uh, is often what uh, we as Protestant Christians tend to be most familiar with. You know, um, I grew up um, in a Methodist church when I was a teenager, and I really thought that it was like Jesus than John Wesley. Um, and sometimes we can kind of go that place, that everything that came before the Reformation didn't really matter, and we just pick up with Luther or Calvin or whoever our reformer is um, that we particularly like. Um, 
This period, though, is, uh, it's a, again, a, it's about the process of theological development. And we see that during this time period, Christianity had been so interwoven with politics and society and all of those things that what we believed and said we believed as Christians in our, in our theology uh, carried political and social implications. And so you see countries and, uh, being developed and redeveloped and rulers and uh, fighting and wars and all sorts of things uh, during this time. Uh, our own church, the Episcopal Church, comes out of this kind of period uh, as a branch out of the, the trunk of uh, the Universal Catholic Church um, during this period, uh, during the English Reformation. And the English Reformation is um, oftentimes heralded as this big, you know, like being the via media, you know, that we are as Anglicans, we're the, the middle way between Catholicism and Protestantism. And while that may be true, um, it wasn't really uh, by design. Uh, many of the reformers wanted to go further than what was um, what was finally done. And the Elizabethan Compromise was really kind of how we got there. And it was about trying to put a political end and, and find social rest and peace. Uh, and so we ended up with uh, becoming the Via Media um, really not... Um, because we're an unfinished reformation, an ongoing reformation, as we continue to try to understand... Um, what it means to be a Christian, and how do we wrestle with all the things that have come before and after us um, as, as we build our system of thought. Um, during this time, there's a, um, a new impulse on understanding um, and, and, and understanding how feeling and how the Holy Spirit influences our thinking. Um, and so you see um, that becoming a theological dialogue partner, this sense of feeling, um, the sense of... Uh, experience. Um, there's an emphasis on creeds and confessions during the um, development of catechisms and the confessional movement. Um, and so we see this kind of push towards certainty that we try to define each other and that this is the way things are during this time period. We move on into the modern period, and we see that there are new voices of critiques about all of this stuff that's come before. Uh, reason alone is emphasized during the, the beginning of this time, um, that, that, and that you can somehow, just by thinking, human thinking, human reason, itself develops a kind of natural religion, and that Christianity then must either... Um, be completely reformed or done away with, or must be seen as a supplement to that natural religion that, that, that must coincide with what we see going on in the world, what our observations can tell us, and other things. Um, we see that along with this, though, during and kind of in response to this, we see this appeal to the human imagination and the romanticism um, of development of this time, that it's not just about thinking and, and what we can see and touch and feel, but it's about how our mind can take us places and our spirit can take us places and how we can develop deeper levels of understanding um, beyond using our imagination uh, and not just empirical hard data. Um, we see that there was a, a push towards deconstruction, and this was all over in biblical criticism and also in theology. And there are two important things to think about in this, it's, and it's highlighted in the, in the book as well. And that, that this, this idea that anything that we write down cannot express what we truly want it to express. The whole meaning isn't there. Um, and the second is that even if I have an idea, I can't really even express that. To my, so that it adequately expresses what I want it to express. So not only can the system not hold it, but I can't get out all of what I'm trying to express. Two very important points because they really influence how we approach um, much of our, our Christian theology today, that there's something beyond it. There's something perhaps missing. Um, and, and as we look at how do we develop our statements and our teachings um, going forward and how we wrestle with understanding of things, how, what, are we, what is lacking from our expression of our faith? What is lacking? What can? What piece is just can't be expressed um, in human words and language and and through symbols and other things. Um, we see uh, there are reforms throughout the denominations. The, the big one, Vatican II, and uh, is a really important one in its impact on all of Christianity. The liturgical reforms um, of Vatican II uh, impacted our church and um, many churches around the world as well. Um, and then we uh, the importance of liberal Protestantism. Protestant, Protestantism uh, can't be overlooked as well, especially in um, our world and our ethos of the Episcopal Church. Um, just uh, that uh, 
the importance that if something didn't really fit with our cultural norms or understandings, that one, we either had to abandon it, or two, we had to reinterpret it. Um, and how that um, really created a whole lot of things that just started getting chopped off. And the response to that, the strong response to that neo-orthodoxy, and it's important of calling us back to understanding and wrestling with the whole expression of God, um, self-expression of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, Important developments throughout the modern period are, are in critiques are important. Feminist movement, uh, liberation theology, black theology, importance from outside, around the world. All sorts of different voices from around the world being brought into how we understand Christianity and, and how we in, do some of that reinterpreting um, of, uh, and weighing of Christian ideas. So we find ourselves in a time of flux, even today, that Christian de development is still, Christian thing is still being developed, it's still being wrestled with. But we as uh, ministers, we have to ask ourselves, what is important for my ministry? What is important for you to make known the message of Jesus Christ and, and God's self-revelation to us in the person of Jesus Christ? What things do you need to highlight? How can you not just ignore the things that are difficult, but how can you wrestle with them and understand them in their, in their context and within the whole breadth of a, a wide, um, diverse Christian thinking? Um, so that's a challenge for us today. Um, I hope that you enjoyed your reading, and I look forward to reading your discussions.